Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're so excited to see you all here. My name is Terry Bailey. I'm the executive director for the American Lung Association in Oklahoma. And thank you so much for joining us on what is the last day of Lung Cancer Awareness Month, November. We are reminded this month that about every two and a half minutes, someone in the United States is diagnosed with lung cancer. And every day, lung cancer takes the lives of more than 356 of our friends, neighbors, and loved ones. At the American Lung Association, our mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. We do this through education, advocacy, and research. And today, our goal is to talk about what is happening with lung cancer in the state of Oklahoma and how we can continue to make progress against this disease. So this is the very first time we've ever done a roundtable like this, and I want to thank our advocacy director, Charlie Gagan, for all of his hard work on organizing this event. And also thank you to our fantastic group of panelists for being here and sharing your expertise. I'm really excited to hear from you, and I, I know everybody is too. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Charlie Gagan, our advocacy director covering both Oklahoma and Texas. So Charlie, take it away. Charlie, you're on mute. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Terry. I'm so glad to be here today and thank you all for joining. And I, I do apologize for this flag behind me if you wanna just mentally block that out. Um, but we have a, a great program today. Uh, we are gonna talk about uh, our Lung Association State of Lung Cancer Report. Uh, and then we will follow it up with a round table discussion with some panelists from across the state. Um, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to have questions. And so as as we go through the presentation and you do have questions, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the Q&A or chat box uh, and we can address them toward the end. <clears throat> Released two weeks ago, the American Lung Association State of Lung Cancer Report shows the toll of lung cancer uh, takes in each state in the country, examining rates of new cases, survival, early diagnosis, surgical treatment, lack of treatment and screening, the report indicates that states must do more to protect their residents from lung cancer. For the third consecutive year, the State of Lung Cancer Report explores the lung cancer burden among racial and ethnic groups at both the national and state level. This report serves as both a call, both a guidepost and a rallying call, providing policymakers, researchers, healthcare practitioners, as well as patients, caregivers, and others committed to ending lung cancer by identifying where their state can best focus its resources to decrease the toll of lung cancer. One highlight of this year's report, more Americans than ever are surviving lung cancer. In fact, over the past five years, the survival rate has increased 21% nationally to 25%, yet remains significantly lower among communities of color at only 20%. I will note oh, this report does not reflect the potential impact of COVID-19 pandemic on cancer diagnosis, treatment, or survival, as the data in the report preceded the emergence of the coronavirus. But first, let's talk about what causes lung cancer. And there are a variety of risk factors associated with lung cancer, including smoking, exposure to radon gas, air pollution, and secondhand smoke. Tobacco use, specifically commercial tobacco use, is the leading risk factor for lung cancer. Smoking and secondhand smoke both have been shown to cause lung cancer. Commercial tobacco, your cigarettes, snuff, snus, et cetera, can contain more than 7,000 chemicals and is manufactured by companies to addict people to harmful products that cause death and disease. Traditional tobacco has been used in sacred ways by native peoples for centuries. Today, we'll be, when we talk about tobacco, we're talking about commercial tobacco. And as you see here, the smoking rate in Oklahoma is 19% and significantly higher than the national rate of 14%. It ranks 44th among all states, placing it in the below average tier. And for these and other graphs, as we go through this presentation, the green line represents the average, while Oklahoma is the orange line. Similarly, radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. Radon is a colorless and odorless gas that can seep into homes and buildings. Some geographical areas naturally have higher average radon levels than others, but since any home can be at risk for elevated levels, the only way to know is to do a test. If testing shows interior radon levels at or above the US EPA action level of four picocuries per liter of air or higher, it's strongly recommended to take corrective measures to reduce your exposure to radon gas. Such measures should also be considered at levels at or above two picocuries. In Oklahoma, 10% of radon test results were at or above the action level recommended by the EPA. That ranks seventh among all states, placing it in the above average tier. 
And now for the state of lung cancer. Here we see how Oklahoma fared in each category. And a, a note on methodology, lung cancer incidence, staging, surgical treatment, and lack of treatment data is for the years 2015 through 2019. It includes both malignant lung and bronchus tumors. These data are based on the North American Association of Central Cancer Registries, December 2021 data submission. And support for those registries is provided by the state, province, or territory in which the registry is located. State survival rates are the age standardized percent of cases still alive five years after diagnosis for cases diagnosed in years 2012 through 2018. These data are from the cancer are from the Cancer in North America 2015-2019 Volume 4 Cancer Survival in the United States and Canada 2012 to 2018 from the NAACCR. Screening rates were determined by dividing the number of screening exams meeting United States Preventative Task Force criteria by the estimated number of people at high risk for lung cancer and recommended for annual screening with low dose CT. The number of screening exams meeting that criteria uh, is from the American College of Radiology's Lung Cancer Screening Registry for 2021. And lastly, the number of current and former smokers aged 55 to 80 for each state was estimated using the 2020 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data from the CDC. So let's dive in and see what exactly a report showed for Oklahoma. In the report, states were ranked from best to worst for each cancer specific measure. Statements such as above tier and average tier were determined by dividing each measure, incidence, smoking, etc., into two sets of five contiguous ranges, one set ranging from the maximum observed to the national average and the other from the national average to the minimal observed value. The two lowest categories are classified as bottom tier. The next two are a below average tier, et cetera. For our first metric, new cases of lung cancer. Nationally, close to 237,000 people will be diagnosed with lung cancer this year, with the rate of new cases varying by state. Over the last five years, the rate of new cases has decreased 11% nationally. These are the numbers of new cases per 100,000 residents in each state in the top five and worst five states. You can see there's a very big difference between our top states and bottom states. There are nearly double the number of lung cancer diagnoses in bottom states compared to the top states. In Oklahoma, the rate of new lung cancer cases is 66 per 100,000 and significantly higher than the national rate of 57 per 100,000. That, that ranks Oklahoma 41st among states, placing it in the below average tier. Over the past five years, rates of new cases improved by 6%. Um, also of note, as seen on the overview slide, the rate of new lung cancer cases is 92 per 100,000 population among indigenous people in Oklahoma, significantly higher not only than the national rate, of which is 41, but significantly higher than the rate of white Oklahomans, which is 66. For our other metrics, rate, rates were not, rates between indigenous people were not significantly different than white Oklahomans. Next up, five-year survival rate. In each state, and we see much more geographical variance than with the new cases. Lung cancer has one of the lowest five-year survival rates because cases are so often diagnosed at later stages when the disease is less likely to be curable. The national average of people alive five years after lung cancer diagnosis is 25%, which again is a 21% improvement over the last five years. And similarly, we see here the gap between top and bottom states isn't quite as pronounced, but it is still significant. The, people of, the percent of people alive five years after being diagnosed with lung cancer in Oklahoma is 20%, which is significantly lower than the national rate of 25%. That ranks 46th among the 45 states in Washington, D.C., which we were able to collect data, placing it at the bottom. As you know, most lung cancer cases are diagnosed at a later stage when the cancer is spread to other organs and treatment options are less likely to be curative and survival is lower. In general, the earlier that lung cancer is diagnosed, the more likely that treatments will be effective and improve chances of survival. Nationally, only 26% of cases are caught early when the five-year survival rate is much higher at 61%. Unfortunately, most cases, about 44%, are not caught until a late stage when the survival rate is only 7%. This graph represents the national average of the stage of diagnosis and five-year survival. In Oklahoma, 22% of cases are caught in an early stage, the dark blue there, which is significantly lower than the national rate of 
It ranks 47th among the 49 states with data, placing it in the below average tier. Lung cancer can often be treated with surgery if it's diagnosed at an early stage and is not spread. Nationally, 21% of cases underwent surgery, which was a 4% improvement over the last five years. Rates range from a best at 31% in Massachusetts to a worst at 14% in New Mexico. Now, patients who are not healthy enough to undergo the procedure or whose cancer has spread may not be candidates for surgery, but other treatments may be recommended instead of or addition to surgery, such as chemotherapy, radiation, targeted therapy, or immunotherapy. This report focuses on surgical treatment because it's more likely to be curative. And when we looked at surgical treatment, Oklahoma ranked 47th out of the 49 states with data, with 16% of cases undergoing surgery as part of the first course of treatment. This is unfortunately significantly lower than the national rate of 21%, and again puts Oklahoma in the bottom tier. Um, over the last five years, the percent of cases undergoing surgery in Oklahoma did not change significantly. Now, there are multiple reasons why patients may not receive a treatment after diagnosis. Some of these reasons may be unavoidable, but no one should go untreated because of lack of provider or patient knowledge, stigma associated with lung cancer, fatalism after diagnosis, or cost of treatment. Nationally, 21% of cases did not receive any treatment, and treatment rates actually improved 15% over the last five years. Oklahoma ranked 41st out of 49 states with data, with 23% of cases not receiving treatment. This is higher than the national rate of 21% and therefore puts Oklahoma in the below average tier. I will note uh, over the past five years, this percent has also not changed significantly. Lung cancer screening gives us hope in the effort to defeat lung cancer and represents an opportunity to save lives. Screening for lung cancer with annual low-dose CT scans among those at high risk can reduce the lung cancer death rate by up to 20% by detecting tumors at early stages when the cancer is more likely to be curable. Based on new research, uh, in March of 2021, the United States Preventative Services Task Force expanded its recommendation for screening to include a larger age range and more current and former smokers. This will dramatically increase the number of women and black Americans considered at high risk for lung cancer. Unfortunately, screening rates in this report were from before the guidelines were updated and do not yet reflect screening among those newly eligible. But for screening to be most effective, more of the high risk population should be screened annually. Currently, screening rates remain low among those at high risk. Nationally, only 5.8% of those at high risk were screened. Now here we see a, a large range in the top and bottom states with Massachusetts having the best screening rate at 16.3%, while California has the worst at 1%. So very interesting map here. And here we see those expanded guidelines for screening to now include individuals aged 50 to 80 years who have a 20 year pack history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. In Oklahoma, only 2% of those at high risk were screened, which was significantly lower than the national rate of 6%. Oklahoma ranks 45th among all states, placing it in the bottom tier. Now I have a note here saying that screening rates may be higher in states with large and regional managed care providers that did not share screening data. There were two significant disparities found in our report. As previously mentioned, the rate of new lung cancer cases among indigenous people in Oklahoma is significantly higher than both the national average and the average for white Oklahomans. Similarly, the report found that black Oklahomans saw a significantly lower share of lung cancer diagnosed at an early stage, lower than both white Oklahomans and black Americans on average. Our last metric is coverage of screening. State Medicaid programs are one of the only healthcare payers not required to cover lung cancer screening for the traditional Medicaid population. If screening is covered, Medicaid programs may use different eligibility criteria, prior authorization, or charge for the scan. As a result of the Affordable Care Act, most private insurance plans will need to update screening coverage policies to reflect the updated guidelines for plans beginning in March next year. This past February, Medicare finalized a similar policy expanding coverage of lung cancer screening, and that coverage began, began in February. The Lung Association provided comments to the United States Preventive Services Task Force and Medicare throughout the process to expand the screening recommendations 
and has produced a toolkit to help stakeholders update coverage policies and reflect the latest guidelines, and I'll highlight that later on. The American Lung Association analyzed lung cancer screening coverage policies and state Medicaid fee-for-service programs to assess the current status of lung cancer screening coverage for the Medicaid population. And we found that 46 Medicaid fee-for-service programs cover the lung cancer screening. Only three did not provide coverage, and one state did not have information available. Uh, here we see Oklahoma Medicaid does cover lung cancer screening and is using the updated USPSTF guidelines. In summary, the early diagnosis rate in Oklahoma falls into the below average tier, and the state still has a lot of work to do to make sure that more of those at high risk for lung cancer are screened. Oklahoma has seen improvement when it comes to access. Oklahoma has seen improved access to expanded screening by covering it through fee-for-service Medicaid and through Medicaid expansion. The Lung Association encourages all states to cover lung cancer screening based on the latest guidelines across all plans without any financial or administrative barriers in their Medicaid programs. We find it alarming that Oklahoma falls into the below average tier for the percent of patients receiving no treatment. Some patients do refuse treatment, but issues such as fatalism and stigma can often prevent eligible patients from accessing treatment that may save or extend their lives. And we encourage all patients to work with their doctors and establish a treatment plan and goals. And now I'll introduce our special guests and begin a discussion. And again, if you have questions for our guests, please put them in the chat box and I'll ask them toward the end of the call. Let me stop sharing here. All right, first up, Dr. Mark Dozier is a professor of family and preventative medicine in the College of Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. He currently serves as the Associate Director of Community Outreach and Engagement at the Stevenson Cancer Center and Senior AD of the Community Engagement Core of the Oklahoma Shared Clinical and Translational Research. Dr. Dozier's longstanding commitment to improving health equity in rural and tribal communities has led to studies funded by the NIH, CDC, AHRQ, HRSA, private foundations, and state government. Dr. Dozier's current research centers on partnerships with federally recognized tribes and their healthcare systems to increase receipt of evidence-based cancer screenings. In addition to conducting research and overseeing the program, Dr. Dozier is also a clinically active family physician with over two decades experience seeing patients in public sector. Welcome, Dr. Dozier. Pleased to be here. Our next panelist is Allison Green. Allison is the Cancer Program and Marketing Director for the Cancer Centers of Southwest Oklahoma. Allison worked in private oncology practice in Lawton, and eventually that practice joined with the Radiation Department at Comanche County Memorial Hospital, forming what is now the Cancer Centers of Southwest Oklahoma. In 2013, Allison, along with the COO of the Cancer Center, introduced the low-dose lung cancer screening program to Comanche County Memorial Hospital and offered free screenings to qualifying patients in Southwest Oklahoma. In 2016, they became an accredited facility with the American College of Radiology for LDCTs. Welcome, Allison. Hi. Matthew Akers serves as the Clinical Operations Director for the Reuben White Health Clinic. He has served as the Co-Global Radiology Manager for the Choctaw Nation Health Services since 2016 and the Choctaw Nation since 2008. He previously served roles as radiology director, radiation safety officer, and CT supervisor. Welcome, Matthew. Tiffany Sagata is the current is the clinic operations director for the Choctaw Nation McAllister Clinic, as well as the co-global radiology manager for the Choctaw Nation Health Services Authority. She has served the Choctaw Nation tribe for 15 years, and as a part of tribal healthcare, she not only focuses on primary care but a holistic approach, including dental and optometry services all under one roof. Tiffany, welcome. And our last panelist is Kelly Willingham. Kelly serves as the Oklahoma Hospital Association <laughs> as a health improvement specialist, embedding evidence-based tobacco treatment systems change in hospitals and clinics throughout the state. She's previously worked at the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority as a health promotion coordinator, working to expand tobacco cessation and wellness services and increase the utilization of those benefits. Prior to that, she was a quick coach for the Oklahoma Tobacco Helpline. Kelly, welcome. And Kelly, I'm actually gonna hand it over to you first. Um, I understand just like the Lung Association did a, a, a statewide survey that um, the Oklahoma Hospital Station is also working on a statewide scan of hospitals and what they're doing around lung cancer. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, would love to. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks, Charlie and Terry for having me on here. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, so yeah, we, 
We have a program at the Oklahoma Hospital Association um, called Hospitals Helping Patients Quit. It's a TSET funded program where we mainly work in tobacco treatment, but we're expanding to the preventative lung cancer screening efforts. So recently uh, we did a statewide survey uh, where we emailed the Oklahoma hospital CEOs and asked a couple of questions. So the questions we asked were, do you have a CT? Uh, do you have the equipment? Do you Are you calibrated to do a low dose, a low dose CD, CT scan? And if so, are you accredited? And then if you have these things, do you have a program? Do you have a lung cancer screening program? So of course we haven't uh, received a, 100% uh, responses on that, but we do have a good idea now of what our hospitals and clinics are doing. And um, I, I think we might get into this, but now that we have these responses, we have the funding and the technical assistance to help those clinics and hospitals that either aren't accredited, aren't calibrated, or are those do have those things, but don't have a program. We have the resources available to now help them put those things in place. Thanks, Kelly. And Allison, you, you've had a program in place like this for nearly 10 years. Can you tell us about a little bit about how that got started and, and some of the successes and what you've learned through that process? Well, one of our physicians followed um, a lot of the studies done at the Leahy Clinic and really, you know, lobbied to bring it to us. So we actually went to the hospital administration. Everybody was on board. It was wonderful. And it's been successful. It's rural Oklahoma. We're we're in the country. So the amount of smokers is 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 it's our number one cancer of the breast is lung. So so we have a waiting list for screenings. Very yeah, un very unfortunate. So obviously a lot more can be done and and just accessing and and having giving hospitals the ability to to offer these. Dr. Dosher, um, you are working with both a very metropolitan area in Oklahoma City, uh, as well as more rural areas with the Choctaw Nation. Can you talk about some of the different challenges and and reaching patients in in each area? Uh, sure, though I think a lot of the challenges are similar, um, though geography certainly in terms of travel distance matters a lot for rural areas, as does capacity of follow-up. And we have folks from Choctaw Nation on this panel that can 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 speak more to that. But, um, you know, what I, what I would say around lung cancer screening is, first of all, there's a lack of awareness on the, and this is true in any location on the part of patients and on the part of many providers as well. It's a complex guideline. It's the most complex screening guideline that we have. So even just identifying who's eligible is challenging in primary care. Um, but it hasn't gotten the publicity. You know, it, it, the initial guideline came out in 2014 and then it got updated in 2021. Medicaid didn't cover it till 2021, but uh, it's been around. You know, we're we're in 2022, almost 2023, and this guideline's been around eight, nine years now. Um, and our uptake, as you showed, is phenomenally low. I mean, if you look at the accredited sites, it's what whatever you showed, two percent or thereabouts, or 1.5 percent, somewhere in that range. By self-report, it's a little bit higher, but that that doesn't that includes often more than just screening CT. So you know, in urban areas, it's there's there's capacity. It, you know, in Oklahoma City, there's a lot of centers that do screening, but there's a lack of awareness and lack of demand and stigma that you mentioned on the patient side. Hard for primary care providers to think about ordering the test. It doesn't get, it doesn't have a HEDIS measure or a quality improvement measure the same way that other cancer screenings do. Uh, in rural areas, it gets compounded. Choctaw Nation is fortunate. They have CT scanning equipment that meets the standards and uh, availability of that equipment to do the screening. Some of these locations, their CT scanning gets full up with all sorts of diagnostic testing. So even having the capacity to do it, even if you're accredited, can be an issue. Um, and you know, we you've you've sent us areas, uh, Kelly. You know, your survey you've done that have screening, and it's pretty broadly available. But how much of that is actually occurring at those sites is another question. We're looking into trying to create a mobile lung cancer screening program to be able to reach communities that may not have that where rural hospitals have closed, for example, but also at work sites and you know, other locations to make it more convenient for, for folks to remove those uh, access barriers. And we see that 
being potentially of particular value in rural locations. Um, I think we need to do a lot to increase demand, increase the guideline awareness on the part of the population, and on the part of the providers, and work on stigma at the same time. But I really think there's a there's a demand lack of lack of awareness and need to increase demand issue that we need to do in a coordinated fashion. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Matthew, I, I'd love to hear more about kind of how this partnership with, with Dr. Dozier and the Stevenson Cancer Center came about with the Choctaw Nation. Uh, could you give us kind of the history of that and, and how it's going? Yeah, uh, so at the time, some of these conversations first kicked off. I was the radiology director at our Talahina site, and at the time, it was the only CT scanner that we had, actually. Uh, we're talking probably 2015, 2016 timeframe. Um, and and with that, our reservation sets, and Tiffany will get into kind of some of the challenges with Choctaw Nation, but our reservation occupies about nine and a half counties or roughly geographically about the same size of Delaware. And we had a single CT scanner uh, available. And so the diagnostic load on that single scanner really made it tough to initiate that and some of the other elements of an accredited program. And anyways, uh, we were doing some low-dose CT prior uh, to 2019, but it really wasn't in an organized fashion. It really wasn't a high priority within the organization. Um, in the 2017-2018 timeframe, uh, our internal our, uh, preventative screening committee uh, made a recommendation to the executive leadership that we start a more you know, uh, concerted effort to, to address preventative uh, low-dose lung screening. And right around the 2019 timeframe, we were awarded a TEALS grant that allowed us to put more resources to this program. We we had, and by this time we had added two additional CT scanners to our system. So we went from one scanner to now three, then with the addition of this grant, and we were able to bring on a case manager. I think she's on this call this morning. Um, anyways, and having that dedicated personnel to do the case management side, because from a from a CT perspective, these exams are pretty easy. It's just another protocol that we initiate. Um, but you know, managing these patients once you get them into this program, you know, is a little bit more tedious. And uh, so we were able to onboard that case manager. We also added the uh, lung nodule screening tool or the uh, database to our Omnicare tracking system to help facilitate this and allow the case manager to have access to that information and you know really. Uh, work with our providers and our contract health group and our specialists to coordinate all the care there. Um, and so by the time we got through all this and did a site visit, we kind of started our program in er late 2018, early 2019, and then this thing, COVID happened. You may have heard about it, right? Uh, so we were off to a good start, and then COVID really put, uh, with the impact to our organization in particular, it really kind of challenged the growth of that new program. And so we kind of saw some uh, kind of some suppression in our numbers early on from COVID impact. But as we kind of emerge post COVID and even today, we see those numbers continue to pick up. And I mean, I think the first year that we did um, just ballpark numbers, but the first year that we kind of attempted this before COVID, we'd managed to get like 260 some odd exams done. Uh, but we, you know, shortly after that, that number st started doubling year after year after year. Uh, and I think most recently in 2022, we're up to uh, a little over 11,000 exams in 2022. And I spoke with our case manager this morning, and we're we're seeing about 50 new additional participants per month coming into our low dose screening program. So uh, whether we can sustain that growth or maybe it tapers off, you know, is yet to be seen. But uh, it definitely shows that this was an unmet meet or an unmet need in our area. Thank you, Matthew. And, and Tiffany, as someone else also working on this project, I'd be curious if you had anything to add uh, to what Matthew said. I mean, I think Matt, Matt did a great job in covering it all. The one thing I would like to add is, you know, we're doing an expansion here specifically at the McAllister Clinic, and so we're going to be adding a CT uh, scanner here as well. So that'll be another scanner that comes on board, and we made sure that that package included the low-dose CT. So uh, you know, one of Matthew and I's dual rows is that cold global for radiology, and so we try to be um, very promotive of the low-dose CT and making sure that anytime we have a CT on board at any of our sites that we include that so we can continue to expand the service and accommodate the, the growing needs for it as well. And I, I, Tiffany, I know we've talked a lot about, you know, awareness and just make sure folks are aware of this scan, but, 
Can you talk about some of the other barriers that patients face, even if they're aware of the scan? I'm thinking transportation, navigating health insurance, uh, cancer literacy. How are you all addressing some of those challenges? Yeah, so some of the same um, challenges that Dr. Dozier touched on previously is some of those that we see just within our uh, travel health system. You know, obviously we are in a rural area in Oklahoma, and so we have patients that travel um, abroad for our healthcare services, even as far as out of state, Texas, California, pretty much all over. Um, and so we we battle those travel restrictions. We try to accommodate as much as we can, especially for those that are out of state. If they're qualifying, we know they're going to come in, they're going to be here for two days, and they try to get that all-encompassed health care, that holistic approach that so we try to accommodate those needs and get them in for those screenings, right? Because it's really tough if they're here and you're like, hey, you need this screening. They're more apt to get it done versus, man, I'm about to fly back out to get this done, and then we can run into the whole cancellations and putting it off. So we try to accommodate that. Um, I would say we've not, um, I would say we, I mean, we've been, successful but not probably to the fullest either so we still face that challenge from time to time um, just like Dr. Dozier touched on you know knowledge is key and so patient education provider education and even our providers understanding you know it's really hard with EHR to determine that pack your history and then the patient history like you know them being consistent with providing the information that they give us and so that's one of the challenges that we face um, the third is probably just the unknown. A lot of our patients don't want to know. And so they know they've smoked for years. They're scared what it's going to show. And so they just are kind of, you know, opt out of it altogether. And so, again, that stigma and trying to overcome some of that. And then one of the other aspects of it is our referral process. And so once those low dose CTs are performed, and they come back abnormal or, hey, we've got to send these people out for biopsies, then we have what we call a referred care process. And it is not an easy process to get through. So, you know, once you get in the referral, it's placed by your PCP, then we, um, you know, if you don't have an insurance payer, then you have to apply for alternate payer source. Um, there's very strict federal guidelines that we have to follow. And so it's a lot of hoops our patients have to jump through to even get that process started. And then there's the whole approval or denied process. Um, through our case management board, and then just the coordination of that once they're approved with the outside facility. Um, and we ballparked some numbers, Matthew and I did this morning, and in FY22, it looks like we furred out around 38. And so, um, you know, it's just continually fighting that battle because, you know, it's, it's A, getting to know it, know what the issue is, and know that it's there, and then B, trying to follow that process and see that patient all the way through. Allison, I'm, I'm, as someone who also works in, in rural Oklahoma, I'm sure a lot of what Tiffany talked about, you know, is the same in your area. Can you elaborate on kind of what the challenges and how you're addressing them? Yes, I'm nodding my head the whole time. She <laughs> and, and something you and I spoke about was the um, insurance process or referral process, the prior authorizations. It, it, it appears that almost nearly every insurance now is requiring a prior authorization for these. And the process is very lengthy. There's a lot of denials, and it's it's backlogging all of all of our low dose CTs. I don't know about how you guys are doing dealing with that, but um, and we get a lot of denials for them. Um, it was a lot easier, honestly, when no insurance was paying for them, and we just offered them for free. That that was the best that the program was, and the easiest that it was. But the insurance has complicated it so much. Um, that's our big. That is our biggest barrier. That we're facing yeah. right now. I hear you there. Um, we don't have a lot of issues from from referral um, standpoint, other than consistency on smoking history. We we do have some issues with that, and um, we have a lot of physicians who um, they're wonderful about referring, but at the same time they want to tailor the guidelines to what they think should be correct. Um, so we get a lot of um, secondhand smokers, a lot of people who've never smoked or they quit 25 years ago. Um, you know, out of the 30 orders I get a day, I probably eliminate 12 to 15 of them. Dr. Dozier, I'd, I'd be curious, you know, we mentioned that the updated guidelines and, and how they are much more expansive now. You know, do you think those are appropriate and, and what new challenges are, are they bringing with them? Yeah, well, uh, they're probably appropriate. I mean, they had to extrapolate data on it, but it was a reasoned process by U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I think uh, what you're really hitting on, though, is the complexity of this guideline. 
the lack of knowledge of the guideline by providers and providers' tendency to want to do things for patients. Actually, sometimes they don't differentiate screening from diagnosis when people have symptoms. When they send on the other side of it, they send people in with symptoms that need CT with contrast, uh, not screening CT. So it's really complicated for physicians, and nurse practitioners, advanced practice uh, providers, PAs. Um, to order the test, pack your history is hard to get an accurate handle on. What we've done at uh, Stevens Cancer Center and many sites are finding they need to do is a tiered process where people filter in from primary care, but there is a provider, usually a, an advanced practice nurse or a PA who then goes through the criteria and informed decision making with the patient, usually at the same time that the CT scan would be performed, but serves as that conduit to try to figure out, you know, does the patient need the test? Does the patient need something else? Do they meet the criteria? Is the insurance going to work for this or not? So this is this is this is the one guideline that really kind of requires, I think, almost an extra tier of um, checks on how that is done. The, the, the related point I wanted to make on that is um, uh, Matthew mentioned uh, case management, which in the Indian Health Service tribal urban Indian uh, clinic world, case management through the Diabetes Special Emphasis Program and others has been a part of those practices for decades. And so there's an understanding of that. Other uh, practices, traditional fee-for-service world, et cetera, don't really have case managers necessarily. But the other term that we use a lot in prevention is navigation. And um, all I can say, I don't know if we have any insurers on the call, but there has been study after study after study after study for cancer prevention, be it lung cancer screening, colon cancer screening, breast cancer screening, you name it where if you have a navigator function to assist primary care in doing those evidence-based referrals, you get better screening rates. I mean, it's been shown time and time again, much better screening rates. You also get better follow-up on the diagnosis. You talked about that voltage drop between an initial positive screen and then getting all the diagnostic follow-up that's needed and how that can be a morass with insurers and everything else. If you have a case management or navigation process, you can facilitate a, a lot of all that. The problem is we don't have reimbursement mechanisms and fee-for-service medicine for navigation. So I'm just putting a plug in there. To make this screening guideline work well, we need funding for navigation functions like this because that's what it's going to require. Right now, it's on the backs of primary care physicians who have 20 hours a day of other things that they also need to be doing. It's just you can't keep putting the same thing on the same providers, it's, you know, the squeeze and balloon effect. There's just, there, you can't do it. They've got too many things going on. Tiffany, Allison, Matthew, I'd be curious how we all are addressing that, that, you know, need for a navigator, need for someone to kind of case manage the process. Is it, is it just other duties as assigned for existing staff or are you finding creative ways to uh, fill those gaps? Well, we have a navigator and um, she primarily does breast. I'd like to hire a lung only navigator and keep her as just a breast navigator, but I haven't been able to um, to acquire that just yet. But I'm, it's something that's that I've been trying to do for a while because there's a need for it. Our program is big enough that we need a lung navigator for the whole hospital, not just for the cancer center, but for the whole hospital to work with all the physicians, the surgeons, coordinate you know, from this to this to this, it's, it's there. If, if you don't have a navigator, get one. They are amazing. They cut the patient's wait times in, I mean, a, a tent. It's, it's, she's phenomenal. Um, Kelly, you know, we talked at the very beginning about, you know, how tobacco is the leading cause of, of lung cancer. And often it's so critical to, to streamline that process. Once someone has told their doctor, you know, I meet, I meet these criteria. Can you talk about how what the hospital association is doing to, to help streamline those processes? Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So we, again, we have we have a grant to work in hospitals and clinics throughout the state to embed tobacco treatment best practices, so that when a patient comes in, they're screened for tobacco use. If they screen positive, there is a trigger for a consult, a tobacco cessation consult. There's also a trigger for pharmacotherapy, so they get a patch or gum while they're in the hospital. And then, of course, if the patient wants, there is a proactive referral to the Oklahoma Tobacco Helpline. So what we do is we go into hospitals and clinics 
and work with their IT team, their nursing, their RTs to um, change their EMR um, so that uh, the, that workflow changes. Those things are automatically in place. And our ultimate goal is, you know, we have about 70 hospitals and over 400 clinics doing this tobacco treatment work. Um, our ultimate goal is to now, those ones that have a really good robot, robust program, incorporating these, these lung cancer screening efforts, having these automatic triggers um, like we've been talking about. And then on the other end, for health systems that have a great lung cancer screening program, making sure that they've got a robust tobacco treatment program. Um, so that's kind of our ultimate goal, but we're we're in the beginning stages of this, I would say for anybody on the call, um, if you, and I'm, I'm thinking of Tiffany and Matthew too, I'd love to continue partnering, partnering with, partnering, uh, all of a sudden have a speech impediment. Uh, I'd love to partner with you guys and see how we can um, learn what you guys are doing uh, around lung cancer. Um, but of course, uh, talk about the tobacco treatment process, but this is a plug, please uh, reach out to me. We would love to partner um, with folks on tobacco treatment and lung cancer screening efforts. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and, and for folks listening, I just want to remind you, if you do have questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A uh, and, and we can ask our panelists. Um, Tiffany, I want to go back to you. What what gets missed or what, what is unique in the tribal setting when we talk about lung cancer screening or, or cancer screening in general? What, what do we need to be aware of to make sure we're culturally competent when working with um, Indigenous peoples? Um, so, I mean, for us, I mean, tribal and Choctaw Nation as a whole, and Matthew, if I miss anything, be sure to chime in. You know, we are different in that, you know, we do try to do the pre certs as Allison was say, stating, of course, you know, if they have insurance, we would like to bill for those. But that's not a deal breaker for us. And so we have some flexibility. If our patients, you know, qualify for that screening and are we're able to do that, then we can do that, you know. We do have some very culturally sensitive folks, and so they are very, um, we cater to our patients a lot, um, and so we have to be very sensitive sometimes in how we approach um, different uh, screenings and ways that we, you know, visit with them. And so a lot of our providers, you know, have to learn to navigate through that. Uh, but, you know, we overall, we have a pretty good group that does that pretty well. And so, you know, for us, I think it's just um, getting to learn our patients and knowing their needs. And uh, Matt, you got anything to add to that? No, I mean, you covered it pretty well. And what Dr. Dozier mentioned earlier, you know, and others, you know, we do have a higher uh, prevalence of, of smoking within our population. And, um, you know, Historically, our, our our Choctaw population has been pretty stoic, and sometimes they're not, you know, forthcoming with a lot of information with providers. And so, as as we bring new providers into our system, they do have to kind of get accustomed to, uh, you know, providing healthcare in a in a native population. Matter of fact, I believe OSU has actually started tribal health as a tract in their uh, DO program now. Uh, so they do a rotation just in tribal health to kind of learn some of the nuances of that. And, uh, I, I think we'll see positive gains from that moving forward. Dr. Dozier, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I, you know, on that specific question, I think some sometimes the unasked question is, what about traditional use of tobacco? And, you know, certain tribes, that's not universal by any stretch, but many tribes have traditional tobacco use. And that, you know, we've we've done surveys in Oklahoma on that. And, you know, most of what we're talking about here, though, is, you know, smoking cigarettes that meet the criteria for screening. That's not traditional use. So they're really separate processes in most circumstances. So that's um, maybe important, but probably not relevant to whether someone needs lung cancer screening or not, at least in Oklahoma. Uh, I, I don't know if that resonates with the others on the call that are working at Choctaw Nation, but it's not a major factor in terms of the need for cessation services. The other point I wanted to make on that earlier conversation that Kelly had was, uh, you know, when you presented the information on lung cancer screening, one slide, I, I maybe I missed it, but I don't think you had is 
uh, American College of Radiology looks at the referrals for tobacco cessation of those who have received lung cancer screening. And unfortunately, here's another unfortunate for Oklahoma, but unfortunately for Oklahoma, we're in the bottom tier of states for, for those referrals being documented. So that is another big area with lung cancer screening. We need to make sure that the referrals are in place for those who are currently smoking. Thank you, Dr. Dosher. Um, Allison, your clinic does more than just lung cancer screenings. You you do a variety of other cancer screenings, and and I'd be curious, you know, what are the are there any unique challenges to lung cancer, or or what makes lung cancer different than the other cancers like breast cancer or cervical? Well. <laughs> It's, it's really a financial challenge more than anything else with the lung. The lung we do year round. Um, our other screenings are, you know, during their respective month. So we do, you know, like a colon cancer screening, which is really just an eye fob, but we do a head and neck screening and a skin cancer screening and a prostate screening, 100% free. We, we have studied this. We have found that if patients even have to pay, you know, a dollar, they won't come. They won't come. So that's why I say that my the lung program was easier when insurances didn't pay. And we did offer it for free. We do offer um, if you're uninsured, we do it for a very small fee. And nobody ever pays more than fifty dollars. That's that's our general rule. Even if your insurance denies it, fifty dollars. Um, as long as you're qualified for it. But it's financial more than anything, especially in rural Oklahoma, you know, it, it's it our poverty level is 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 low. So if we charge, you know, 50 cents, less people would come. Yeah, yeah. Kelly, um, Oklahoma is one of the, the states that recently expanded the Medicaid eligible population. Um, are you optimistic that that will help, you know, uh, at least bring more money into some of these rural hospitals? Or what, what do you anticipate the impact of that will be in Oklahoma as it continues to, to roll out? Yes, yeah. And I think with the new managed care process, um, so Medicaid expansion, med managed care, this is coming through, I mean, that's one of the main reasons it went through is the it's going to keep rural hospitals uh, up and running. Um, so, yes, I can, I can definitely see that. And um, the other thing I was going to add about Medicaid is they have um, folks on their team that are working around this lung cancer screening efforts to make sure that the benefit is in place so that um, there are barriers removed to patients getting a uh, the screening covered, and then making sure that patients uh, and Medicaid members know about this benefit. So they do have a team there working on this. So I think that not only having it available now, having more patients uh, or more members covered, but now getting them to know about this benefit. So um, I did want to give a shout out to them because they're working on this uh, as well. Thanks, Kelly. Um, we've got a question here, and I'm going to Pause it to you, Dr. Dozier. Um, it's a question about clinical trial programs. Uh, can you talk about, we talked a lot about screening and, and getting screened early and the benefits of that, but for those who, who do get screened and, 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 you know, don't get, are not eligible for surgery uh, or, or need, you know, a, a more novel treatment, can you talk about what options are available and, and kind of um, wh what does that look like in Oklahoma? Are folks still often going out of state or are there more and more opportunities in Oklahoma to benefit from clinical trials? Yeah, well, um, I'm going to give you a two-part answer because uh, I'm going to talk about clinical therapeutic trials first. And um, Stevenson Cancer Center is actually uh, amongst the leading clinical trials accrual centers nationally for a variety of cancers. And there are a number of act active lung cancer screening, lung cancer treatment trials currently open. Um, there are still people going out of state, but but most of the um, both industry sponsored and government sponsored therapeutic trials, uh, Stevenson Cancer Center does or does a lot of them. The 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 newest thrust in cancer treatment uh, over the past ten years has been immunotherapy on top of chemotherapy on top of surgery. You know, if you have really staged lung cancer. That's great because it could be curative with surgery or radiation therapy if you're stage one, one B, et cetera. Um, it gets more complicated, of course. Most people present with distant stage, unfortunately. And then you're talking chemotherapy, uh, depending on the cancer type, immunotherapy. And you know, immunotherapy in in my career, uh, you know, I actually thought about going into oncology when I was in med, med school and it was like all chemotherapy, and it was like, okay. Uh, but in the past 10 years, the science has grown so much. I mean, for a lot of the what are called adenocarcinomas of the lung, uh, 
a lot of those are responsive to immunotherapy and, and uh, life expectancy can change dramatically. And over the next 10 years, I think we're going to see similar advances. So they're available, Stevenson Cancer Center, uh, some of the other uh, local oncology groups run clinical trials. The Cancer Center often does the um, uh, all the regulatory processes, IRB things for those sites. Uh, uh, Mercy is part of a, a network of clinical trials that comes out of Springfield, Missouri, actually. And I don't know about Integris or, you know, some of the other larger entities were in or in Tulsa. Uh, but we are expanding clinical trials presence in the state. And the way the science is going, it, it, it's advantageous for people to consider going on those. Um, the other thing to just make you all think a little bit, the other big push right now from NCI and from industry is cancer screening trials with these multi-marker blood tests, DNA tests, uh, or other you know body fluid type tests for multiple cancer risks. Uh, NCI is putting out a big uh, RFA for clinical trials network around cancer screening as well. And so I think you're going to see dramatic changes there. So we're doing lung cancer screening with CT scans now. Don't be surprised if 10 years from now we're doing a blood test with advanced imaging or something along. So there, there's going to be a lot of change in technology coming up that should help patients ultimately. We, I'm not going to talk about healthcare costs because all that you know, increases costs. Screening always, you know, loses money for a healthcare system, but it also brings in other revenue for hospitals because you end up treating non-cancer things that get detected as well. Great. Well, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, I'm curious, uh, so all of our guests, is there anything else you'd like the attendees here to know about uh, your programs or, um, uh, you know, any any resources that are available? Okay, if there are. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to jump back into our, our last couple slides here and, and close out for the day. Let's see if I can do this. Charlie, it does look like someone has a question or help yeah. their hand up. Let me actually, I, thank you for flagging that. Helen, let me see if I can take you off mute. And uh, do, do, do. Helen, what's your question? Uh, we can't hear you. Maybe muted still. Can you hear me now? Yes. What's your question? Are there any risk if you don't meet the guidelines if you have the screening done? Any risks if you get screening but you don't meet the guidelines? Correct. Yeah, well, uh, I'll give you probably more complicated answer than than you want. In a, in a word, you know, yes, there are some risks to screening because there's always a certain percentage of people that might have false positives. You might see an incidental nodule that requires extra workup, um, et cetera. So, you know, you, you could also discover a cancer. It's just that the data for the guideline are based on selecting a population that's at highest high enough risk for the disease that it's worth doing it at the population level. Um, but, you know, if you do it and you don't meet the guideline, we don't know what the risk benefit ratio is there. But any imaging test, there's a risk benefit ratio. If I went and got a chest x-ray, plain one, there'd be a risk benefit ratio because they might find nodules. And then what do I do, um, even though I don't have symptoms? So, yeah, there are always some risks with screening. I wouldn't recommend if you don't meet the criteria getting screened because those criteria were set up for a reason. It's the That's the population parameters in which screening benefits outweigh the risks. If you're outside of that, then the risks are likely to outweigh the benefits. Uh, I, it's a complicated answer. We could we could <laughs> we could give okay, you some math equations. One more quick open. question. Yeah. One more quick question behind that. If you find um, nodulars afterwards and they want you to do it every six months, um, is that something that should be done or wait every yeah. year? Yeah, I mean, if you see nodules that could become significant, they have criteria, and Matthew might be able to answer that, but there are criteria based on the size and the morphology or the, the characteristics of the nodule, what it looks like, uh, in terms of what that interval should be and at what point it should be biopsied. And so it might be six months, it might be 12 months. It kind of depends on what it is and, and what it's like on past exams as well. Thank you. Thank you, Helen.
All right, so let me just get to our last couple of slides here. Let's see if it takes me where I was or back to back to the beginning, of course. Right. So uh, before I go, I wanted to share a few resources. Uh, this past July, the Lung Association released a new billing guide to help public health and healthcare stakeholders understand lung cancer screening coverage and reimbursement. The billing guide includes information on coverage requirements by types of health insurance, coding and documentation requirements, smoking cessation interventions, implementation challenges, including timing of health plan compliance, ordering provider, prior authorization mechanics, and tobacco cessation claim denials. And you can find more information at lung.org slash lung hyphen cancer hyphen coverage. Similarly, uh, we are currently in open enrollment for the Federal Healthcare Exchange. And so if you do not have uh, health insurance, so I would encourage you to, uh, to go look at the exchange. And thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there's significant financial assistance to help people afford quality coverage for the next three years. Um, and similarly, the Lung Association has resources at lung.org slash open enrollment. Uh, but that's a wrap for today, folks. I want to thank you again to all of our panelists sincerely for their time um, and their hard work. I want to thank everyone who joined us today uh, to talk and, and learn more about lung cancer. Um, together, we can help improve a lot of these metrics uh, just by, by talking about it more with our with our networks of friends and families. So um, if the Lung Association can be resourced, please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I will say have a wonderful day, everyone, and we'll talk in later. Thank you, Charlie.